not being chasey. All right, a graph, the only graph I'm going to show here, is this. It was actually a fairly low year, 802 tornadoes for the year, compared to more than 1,000. Well, what really makes my chase season, since i got to work for a living, you know, sharks got to work, is this slope here that goes from May 15 up to June 15. That is the slope. That means what? More tornadoes happen in that time period. So that's where I take my vacation usually. However, once in a while, I'll chase in April. And that's what I'm going to talk about first. Actually, three chase cases. April 17. How many of you chased April 17? Anybody here in the audience? Raise your hand up tall. So Sharky can see him. <laughs> Very good. Well, you know who I'm here. This little F-grade movie happened to make a blockbuster hit. Sharknado, enough said. How many people watch Sharknado? Admit it, come on, come on. All right, oh my gosh. And Sharknado 2, Shark Happens, the second one. Absolutely. All right, well, let's get serious for a moment. You know, I am serious. And uh, look at the surface weather conditions at 10 a.m. That's what I usually make my forecast. And so what we see here is a stationary front across Oklahoma in the southeast Kansas, and it's freaking cold in Kansas coming on south. Dry line is way back, so it's not a player today. And we have a cold front, obviously, there. With the moisture coming on up 73 over 67 at Wichita Falls. Wow. I had a good chasing on today. Look pretty good here, although I'm not one for chasing fronts, and I'll tell you why. <coughs> why? It's because there's a lot of linear lifting and linear forcing there. I don't like chasing very cold fronts. I'm a dryline kid. All right, well, let's look at a 850 millibar map. There's my cousin in the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> Ample moisture is denoted by the green lines there. And the target is that ellipse. I always draw an ellipse for my target. And we have a nice low level jet. What's our wind at Oklahoma City? 50 knots. Not bad, huh? That's pretty good. And then look at 700 millibars. We have a closed low sitting over where? Western Colorado. Look at the amount of wind coming through there from the southwest. That looks pretty good. Usually we see a lot of weak winds, right? In the summertime, at 700 millibars, and that spells what? HPs, right? 500 millibars, look at that deep trough. When I see this, it's, it's like a chum in water for me. You know? <laughs> I'm very much attracted to it. That's right. The chum in water attracts sharks. That's what I am, shark today. Alright, and you can see 50 knots over Amarillo, not bad, that higher wind is actually coming towards the target area, not bad. What do we have at 250 millibars? A giant open jaw. <laughs> That's right, doesn't that look like a giant open jaw? When you see that, you know you need to be in between that, right? That's the split flow, it'll help spread out that anvil. And there's the target sitting right there, almost in the mouth. And again, this is 7 a.m. You've got to think about what's going to happen 12 hours in advance. That's going to be moving on in. You're going to have the higher winds moving in towards the target area. Fantastic. All right, let's take a look at some soundings, because we like soundings, right? Especially deaf soundings. All right, we're looking at the O-U-N, Oklahoma. It's very cold there. It's 57 over 54 at the surface. And we have a northeast wind at the surface. So that, that means what? Are we north or south of the front? North. Or north of the front. That's right. Now the hodograph has some great low level turning, but then it turns into a beer crane and a crumpled beer can above that. And that's not too big a bit. Well, quick, quick. Yeah, crumpled beer. Okay. All right, one kilometer, six kilometer down here, the bottom. It's unidirectional. What does that say about storms? 
unidirectional. It means line, no shear, that's right. <clears throat> the surface cape here is zero, wonderful. Mixed layers, 1040. But we do have some good deep layer shear, and that will help. If you go a little further south to Fort Worth, now you're in the warm side of the front, 74 over 73. You've got some capping inversion, though, up there. And look at your cape, 3596 at the surface, and the sin, minus 132 at the mixed layer. And that's not too bad for 7 a.m. And that gets to be burned off later in the day. I think you're going to have some pretty good overturning. Well, look at the shears down there. One kilometer, six kilometer. That's pretty good separation. You have a little bit of directional shear as well as speed shear. Now, the graph doesn't look too bad, especially if you have an east or southeast moving storm. The storm relative helicities will be much better. All right, so let's look at the day one, shall we? SPC. Anybody here look at this SPC website? Right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, here, my ellipse is on the very southwest quadrant. You know, moderate risk, that gets my, uh, my juices flowing. And then uh, here are the tornado probabilities on the gradient, western gradient. I like that a lot. All right, so here's my forecast. Early season, fast moving storms, I expect along the stationary front. There's problems with the storms seeing each other, because one storm's going to go up, and the next one further south, and that tends to be lined out. <clears throat> My strategy was to play the tail end Charlie storm. Expect supercells early, followed by a squall line along the front. And I figured to drop, drop south late in the day. My target? Frederick, Oklahoma. Anybody here been to Frederick, Oklahoma? That's right. It's not Froderick. <laughs> now for the tornado watch issue. Yeah, 120. Again, that gets, oh, right. You're right there. Fantastic. <clears throat> but if you get on the north side of that front, guess what? You're going to need a bigger coat. <laughs> Nothing really has changed here at uh, 3 o'clock. And the dry line here did kick out a little bit. Look at Childress, 69. Look at Lubbock, 91 over 13. This is April, and it's 91 degrees at Lubbock. With a 13 dew point. So Carson Eats and myself went up and stopped at Oakland Union. That's a good fork in the road for us. Highway 183 leads up to Frederick. 287 leads up to Vernon. The front is indicated by the black line, and it's in the 40s above that. So you see there's already, by 3 o'clock, storms firing. Yuck. And they're linear. Yuck. And there's one cell up over the front. Well, fortunately, no, it's close to home. Uh, the shark needs to keep moving, though. So um, what happens here is we decide to go up to Vernon, check it out. And we say, nah, this doesn't look very good. Let's go back to Oakland Union and go north to Frederick. And there's Frederick up there on Highway 183. We get up there and, oh, what is this? This is a nice looking rain free base with a ragged lowering under it. That's not bad. All right, we'll watch it for a while. Hey, what do you know? There's FDR right there. <laughs> I always like to have radars very close to uh, the target storm here. And here we've got a nice hook echo it's sitting there. Or me, I'm at me. There's Highway 5 east of Frederick. And the little SM in the blue box is the square mile. So I'm quite a ways uh, away from it. But would you chase this? Well, sure. It's a hook echo. I'm attracted to hooks, especially when there's bait on the end of that hook. <laughs> of course. So, we decided to swim alongside the storm. Here on the radio velocity, we're just seeing some weak convergence where the hook is at. No big deal. We'll watch it for a while. Keep in mind that radar only measures wind components toward or away from the radar. So we're only seeing a piece of the wind. We don't really know what the wind direction is. Here, watching this, and I'm looking at the reflectivity 416, and what do I detect? Some small echoes. Something's out here, and it looks like a gust front ahead of the hook echo. Yuck. What does that mean? You see a gust front ahead of a hook echo. It's an elevated storm. Do we like chasing elevated storms, everybody? No. All right. But we have a nice looking hook. Look at that. 
I'm, I'm moving further east, keeping up with the, the storm. There's Highway 5, and of course FDR is laughing. He's down in the lower left. Uh, see this? I don't think this is going to have any happy ending here. Uh, see the best front moving on out. It's way ahead of that hook. You know, you can tornado if it catches up with that gust front, but the outflow continues to surge more and more to the east. And you can see some of that here. We have kind of a linear wall cloud. The tail cloud extends off to the north, and we have a linear base. I'm not too excited about that. 416. Uh, it continues. I'm sitting there kind of in the notch. Look at the hook straight out. The gust front is roaring out ahead of it, 416, or 435, rather. So, <laughs> I did what Hooper did. I stuck my tongue out, and I said, blah, I don't want any part of this. I'm done with it. And, of course, another factor was east on Baseline Row, which is east of Manitou, is that beautiful road that you see to the south, west. Yeah, no, lower left. Do you want to travel on that kind of road, especially when it's full of... Uh, muck already from the forward flank raining on it? I don't think so. So really, the fact that it was outflow dominant and the fact that we had a horrible road network east, I just said forget it. And this is the last shot of the storm that we took just off to the north. It had a nice lowering. It's elevated though. So, I saw on the radar, ah, the game's afoot. We have a second supercell with a hook echo just west of Frederick. So we decided to tie tail it back to Manitou, down 183 to Frederick. Again, it had a convergence line there, not too bad. And there's Froderick, not to be confused with Frederick. We crossed the, the stationary outflow boundary. It was dramatic. We went from very cold air into very warm, humid air. Guess what happens to your windshield when that happens? <laughs> it fogs on up. You're blinded for a moment. Yeah. Of course, most sharks aren't blind. They just go by sense of feel. But uh, here we are with uh, four, 517. We've got this nice convergence zone. It's pretty much hugged up against the hook echo. I'll watch it for a while. We're just north of Frederick. It's linear again. It's a nice lowering. You see all this scud to the south of the wall cloud? That bodes bad news. This is more outflow kicking on out. The base is also linear. This is supercell number two. And it's yuck again. My goodness, what are we going to do? Look at that hook. Look at the hook up by the lightning. But these are outflow dominant storms. Not good. Well, one thing I liked about the storm near Frederick was that the outflow was starting to surge ahead. It was getting a little bit of cyclonic circulation showing up. Not much. Northwest of Frederick. As the base passed over us, not much rotation. And, you know, again, second supercell, not too good looking. But it had kind of a ball on the end of it, even though the gust front was out ahead of it. Maybe it'll catch up to it. Maybe you'll get that circulation down to the surface. So we played along with it for a little bit. There was a gust front well out ahead of the hook. Yuck. Look at that. It's wrapping back in the J. That certainly should mean some circulation's there, right? You would think. Beautiful hook echo. Well, I lost patience. Sharks are not very patient. So I said, forget supercell number two. Surging outflow, I don't like that. All right. When we look at the big picture, we have not a squall line like I expected, but five supercells. All of them outflow dominant except for this down at the very lower left. What is that down there, everybody? That is Tail and Charlie the Tuna. That's right. That's what that is, Tail and Charlie the Tuna. All right, well, good. That's what I want to take a look at. So we're hiding, or, or swimming, I should say, hiding and swimming, <laughs> down 183 to Oakville Union once again. You know, sharks do come back to the same place every once in a while. They typically go in circles, and that's what we're doing today, going in circles. We got down there, we got back into warm air, it was very hazy, this is the base I see. I'm not too excited about this, there's no lowering there, there's no scot or anything going on there. But yet, it starts to form a hook echo at 742, look at that. And I'm at me, Oakland Union. Now here's the 
here's the problem. You get this purple haze in there. We all know about purple haze, right? Absolutely. Yes, purple haze occurs every once in a while when these radars get some sort of anomaly there, either beam blockage or something else going on there. But we couldn't tell what was going on in the purple haze. You know? That's, I guess, what you're smoking. Um, all right. 752. 752. Or uh, the radar reflectivity here. And look at the hook again. With the tail on it. Not too bad. We positioned ourselves. Carson and I were just east of Oakland Union. And we're going to run out of room here. There's a thing called the Red River. That's a meandering orange line up there. Any of you ever been caught on the wrong side of the Red River? <laughs> it happens quite a bit. <laughs> well, the only way we can get across it is in Oakley Union, and I'm not going to go back through the course, so I decided, well, we'll just ride it east and see how far this goes, see if it becomes outflow dominant like all the other supercells of the day. Well, lo and behold, it was kind of interesting. We started getting a little bit of anticyclonic circulation there just over Oakley Union, and the base was starting to look a little interesting here. We don't know what's happening up in the purple haze yet. So, one of the things that I want to uh, kind of draw your attention on, maybe Howie or Chuck or somebody can allude to a little bit of this, but this is interesting. Right where I have the yellow circle, we started getting a nice couplet developing, but it's nowhere near the echo. It's like out ahead on the leading edge of the gust, or really at the top or apex of it. Taking a look at uh, WSRED, see? We got the circulation right away, green towards, and there's me just behind the gust front. Well, that's interesting. What happens if the hook echo catches up with that circulation? And it did. And then some magic begins. I've not really seen this kind of detail before where the circulation occurs out ahead and then the storm catches up to it. But sure enough, it begins to rotate. Of course, we're going to run out of road here, northeast of Herald, Texas, at 801. We're also running out of what else? Daylight. 801 in April, absolutely. Okay, well, look, we get a J forming on the end of that hook echo, and that circulation matches with that J, and things begin to happen very, very quickly. Nice couplet begins to develop. Not too strong, but it's there, right? You see it? 806. Guess what? We've got a tornado on the ground. There's a power flash. We're looking northeast. We're looking northeast at the tornado. We're in a safe place. But we do have strong RFD winds happening at this stage. This tornado kept on going. Yes! <laughs> Persistence pays. You keep going and going and going. You know, you're, you're defeated, 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 and then at the end of the day, bingo. All right, well, this begins to wrap up nicely. We're running out of, can't go any further, can't cross the Red River, at least in my vehicle. And uh, we have a nice couple up there at 810. Look at this at 815 with almost a donut hole there. 815, weak, but still there. 815, wow. And we left it at 818, it lifted. We saw this funnel as it goes over the Red River. Now, when it gets over the Red River in Oklahoma, oh yeah, that's when it gets its act together. Yeah, sure, when it gets into Oklahoma. <laughs> there was a big tornado in Texas, and then we get one in Oklahoma, and wow, things go crazy. But now we've got this nice J here, and we've got this circulation that you'll see a lot better in the yellow circle. Gust front coming out. Look at that couplet. Not too shabby, huh? Actually, a couple of pixels folded over there on the red into green. That's right. It pecks the scale. Goes past 70 knots on the outbound. Comes back another 10 knots there. 80 knots. And it has a nice little <coughs> hole there at the end of the hook. Meanwhile, all we can do is sit in Texas and watch it over the river. <coughs> it's rain red. Can you tell that? By the beefiness of that hook? I'm using some slang here. Don't mind me. Um, and then um, we've got uh, this folded over outbound velocity. You can see it's rain wrap. There's no way we could see this tornado. It's dark. We were south of it. We let it go. We're not going to chase it. And there it is. Still on the ground. 4 843. Responders did report. 
Just driving along Highway 70 near Grandfield. All right. Not bad of a forecast. So I managed to go up to Frederick, stay there, fool around with a couple of alpha dominant supercells, and then come back. And finally, at the end of the day, where we started from, we got ourselves a tornado. So the summary, five supercells developed along a quasi-stationary front. Each supercell had a pronounced and persistent open hook echo that was frequently undercut by outflow. Again, I'm tra attracted to hooks that have bait on the end of them, like a debris ball or something. And then uh, tail end storm finally produced two tornadoes, 806 and 835, lasting about 12 minutes, as outflows did not undercut the updrafts at that time. All right, so kind of your moment of zen. <laughs> then we move on. May 19th, 2013. How many of you chased May 19th, 2013? Wow, a lot of you are out there. All right, it was kind of an interesting day for me, Wichita, South Haven tornadoes. By the way, some new movies are coming out. I think might be interesting. It's called Sharkado. Um, it's an underwater volcano, it would have made too much sense. And, and then Sharkanami this fall. And the T is silent but it's deadly, okay? So, watch out for these two new movies coming out this year. That's right, Sharkano and Sharkanami. All right, let's look at the 10 a.m. surface weather map here. Well, we've got a nice dry line. I love this situation. This is, I usually chase in Oklahoma by this, but I got too antsy about it, and we're trying to pick a target here. This is my friends in the lower right. Um, we're looking at the target here. What are we going to do? Well, chose 81 over 29 with a west wind, dry land bulge. Yes, I'd play Oklahoma. Why would I not? Well, I'm interested in the back winds in northern Oklahoma. 73 over 72 near Enid. Got my forecast eclipse over Wichita in the mass of back winds. That's the blue outline. That's the back winds. And why do we like back winds at the surface? Anybody? Promotes veering. Okay. Anybody else? We're looking for, yes. Right. Your helicity values are going to be higher. Your spinning, right, is going to be higher. Fantastic. Okay. But here's the thing. At 850 millibars, I saw that the moisture was being driven out of central Oklahoma by this 40 knot southwest wind in Oklahoma City. That spells disaster, doesn't it? It spells cap, spells shallow moisture, it says, I don't want to have to deal with Oklahoma. I want to go up in, in Kansas then and chase. All right? That's one of the reasons why I said go north. <clears throat> 700 millibars, we got this close low over South Dakota. Trough comes on down. We've got west winds at, uh, well, kind of weak at Amarillo. 20 knots, I don't like to see that. Again, looking like HP's down there, even if something goes. But at 500 millibars, nice broad trough. 50 knots sitting there at uh, Oklahoma City. Well, that's not too bad with that wind coming in there. We're almost on the left side of that jet. But this is what I like. Wow. A narrow, knifing, diving jet. That's bringing some energy south, folks, and that spells what? That spells chasing. You see that? It's time to go chasing. Especially the front left of that exit region. Yeah. All right, well, let's look at a few soundings here. We like to look at soundings. Looking at the Oklahoma City sounding, we've got this cat. Look at the 7 a.m. Sin is minus 414. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's a bad thing. Well, <laughs> you got a lot of cap there to deal with. You got pretty good to deep layer shear, in, but not so much directional shear on that. The hodograph has a nice loop in the little lower layers, and then crumples up above there. Looking at some of the CAPE-related composite factors, how many of you go on SBC mesoanalysis and use these composite factors? Raise your hand. All right. Do you know what they mean? Or you just like to look at the bullseye? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if you, if, you, if you go on the right side of those composite indices, there's a question mark. 
do click on it, and it'll take you to some of the papers by Thompson and Edwards that are fantastic. And even if you don't understand it all, at least you'll pick up some things. That the supercell composite is a function of key, storm helicity, and a uh, bulk wind difference. So it is related to Cape, but you see that the Cape factor is showing, what, 12 around Oklahoma, Kansas border, north of Oklahoma City. Again, you wouldn't want to chase Oklahoma City because of the cap, we just saw. And then for STP, what is that? Is that a motor oil? <laughs> the chaser says not a motor oil, is it? <coughs> no. Okay, so here is a function of CAPE again, a thing called LCL. You know what that is? Lifted condensation level, yes. Again, you got some sin there, and that kills basically the Texas area. So it looks like oh, northern Oklahoma, southern Kansas. It's good. Moderate risk again. I love moderate risk. And then uh, gradient on the west side 15% hatched. Okay, forecast. Classic severe weather setup, folks. You know what that surface low in the Texas Panhandle and the dry land bulge in West Central Oklahoma? This is a chase day. A narrow upper jet entering Oklahoma. Storms will be racing northeast with that, though. That's one of the negatives for the day. I'm concerned about where the south end of the convection will be. This is always a concern. Where's the south end? Where's the cap going to be? <laughs> What's going to break? Obviously, my strategy is always just drop south during the afternoon. Target Wichita. I get to Wichita, I must be in the right place. There's Pettis and Forbes. <laughs> All right. So there it is. Right next to the now, no, me, museum piece vehicle in the background, there, right? <laughs> at the OU uh, sounding here, 1 p.m. This is 1 p.m. now. So the sin looks like, oh, it's only a minus 100 there, the mixed layer. That's not too bad. You have to overcome that a little bit. Boy, it's great deep layer shear. Nice uh, turning with height there. But then it kind of goes to heck in a handbasket there above that. All right, look at Lamont. You know where Lamont is? Somewhere up there near you. <laughs> it's up there in the north. It has about the same amount of sin as better deep layer shear and photograph, well, not too great there, pretty much linear. But I liked it a little better than what I saw in Oklahoma. Also, I like this. When you look and see a mixed layer cape, and you see this arrow in there, which is never there, I have to put it in there, but if, <laughs> when it's there, it's a dry punch moving on in, and that's moving right for my target area. This is fantastic. 150 at 20 watch boxes issued for Kansas. Guess where I'm at? Having lunch. Forbes and Bettis in Wichita. We decided, <laughs> at least I, I decided to go down to the southwest of Wichita to get right on the dry line. What's going on? Are you chasing blue sky again, Tim? No, this is a tornado sky. You know about it, right? You've been out there. You feel the wind. You see those cues ragged as they are, racing to the north, you have a bright blue sky, and you know it feels like tornado. Even though you couldn't convince a passerby that it's a tornado sky, that is a tornado sky. Two o'clock, getting very excited. 210 explosion, just to the west. That's 210, keep that time in mind, and you'll see what goes on just in the next hour. Oh. No, no, I don't want a tea box from Oklahoma. <laughs> Please don't do that to me. I'm in Wichita. Don't do that. I hate getting nerded from behind. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. Okay, well, here we are, 2.30, it's Wichita, and we've got a beautiful cell, glows up, and it looks just like a super cell right off the bat. It's got his little tail on the end of it. And uh, we're southwest there, 2 30. The explosion occurring over Oklahoma City. Oh no, how could that happen? It's supposed to be dry down there. Nothing's supposed to go on. Once again, you know, 
You can't be in all places at once, so you gotta dance with the one that brung you. You might as well go out to Wichita and just stay there. Well, by 2.56, and remember now, at 2 o'clock, it was tornado sky. 2.10 was our first towers. We already have a lowering on this base at 2.56. Just 46 minutes into convection initiation. Amazing. Okay, hey, whoever put Highway 42 in Kansas, I want to kiss your feet. All right. <laughs> <laughs> because it is a wonderful highway, let me tell you. Yeah, right there, uh, you know, Super Silicon is just north. I can scoot up 42, right, and just be, be right there in Wichita. No time. 258. 258 here, nothing's going on in radio velocity. We have our purple haze back again. There's got to be something southwest of the Wichita that's blocking this beam here because it's persistent. We had a nice wrap at 258. Moving on up the highway. Nothing there in radial velocity, but something looks pretty good here. We have this C-shaped echo. It's not your classic supercell, is it? What kind of supercell is this? If it's not classic, you only got two choices. <laughs> it's HP! That's right. Hewlett Packard supercell. <laughs> That's what they call them, right? Okay, well here, nothing on, on radial velocity, getting more blockage here. But look at this to the west. Wall cloud, tail cloud, roaring in from right to left. Wait a minute, what's going on in the south? Holy cow, there's a tornado in progress out ahead of everything to ourself. Well, that's crazy, right? You're expecting the tornado to be where? Under the wall cloud. No, this is out ahead of another cell that is coming in to merge. It's a rain area, you see it on the right. And the tornado developed ahead of that rain area, almost like a land spout type thing. So now we're starting to get some great data because we're really close to it. <clears throat> That's right. There we are, just a few miles. Again, the square mile there in the blue box down in the lower right. Nice hook developing with the yellow circle that I added in because you'll see that on radial velocity. And here we're starting to get some nice inbounds that are folding over. In other words, it's pegging that 70 knot scale and it's going up past that. That's what you get those <clears throat> green on reds. That's what it means. <clears throat> So I'm out ahead of it, moving up the great Highway 42. There's the eye developing at the tail end of this beefy hook. If you were east or southeast of this yellow circle, what would you see? Rain. Rain. You wouldn't see anything. You have to be in the notch. Is that dangerous? Yes. I want everybody to understand. How many of you here have been in the notch in your life? Raise your hand. Come on, be honest. Be honest. Wow. A lot of people. Yeah. And it is dangerous. Okay. Look at radio velocity. Getting a nice couple here, folding on over. There's me. Hmm. Look at that blue box there. I'm not too far away from that. <clears throat> That's right. In fact, just to my south here, I see this rain wrapped area around what appears to be a nice circulation, which then descends at 332 and begins a multi-vortex. There's actually two multiple vortices right here. You probably see them as in, the, in the lower uh, part of the screen, right next to the ground there. And sure enough, this beefy hook is wrapping just to myself as I'm paralleling it up Highway 42. And we look at the radial velocities, and again, we have the inbounds folding over, and me. I'm not too far away, am I? Tornado is just off to my right here, looking south. Multiple vortex, less than a half mile away. Just turning along. Finally complete, it's, a, it's rain wrap right here, 339. And that's your picturesque view of a rain wrap tornado. That's what you get when you're in the notch, when you finally get full condensation. Not something you're gonna sell to National Geographic, okay? <laughs> But this starts to move away from me. I'm now a couple of miles away from this donut as it's moving towards the city of Wichita. There's uh, 235 on the west side going around. And I'm on 42, just south of the airport. Nice couplet there. Do you think Wichita's in trouble? Could be. Absolutely. I thought we were going to have a major tornado go through the city right here. You know, I thought, uh-oh, here we go. And then... <coughs> 
I came up to 235 and so did the tornado. The tornado then suddenly lifts. I don't know exactly why. Had a nice couplet there. But before it got to 235, it lifted. So we found out when we got through the rain core that the whole thing started to gust out in a big squall line. And that gust front is indicated by the white line I put there. And we roared south on 35. Now, why would we do that? Well, that's my strategy, is to go south and play the tail end storm. There's the gust front. 30 minutes later, bingo, we're in South Haven, Kansas. <coughs> Looking, uh, uh, exiting on 166, we see this tail end of the storm. Looks interesting. We drive to South Haven at uh, 2433, uh, and I notice this little interesting little notch in the reflectivity on the very southern end. And again, I put the yellow circle on there. It's kind of an interesting little tiny weak couplet sitting there. It's kind of interesting, 428. It moved past, moved overhead, and then another one starts to develop. At 432, there are two of them, two couplets, right there. And we're just sitting there west of South Haven looking. All of a sudden, holy cow, jaw-dropping it is. <laughs> That's right, 435, we get this tornado, again, ahead of the uh, another cell coming up and having the precip there, right out in the open field, half a mile away from us, and it just, I mean, it's just amazing. Everybody's jaw dropping on this one, as it continues, and it continues, and it continues, and here it starts to rope out, tilts up overhead, and this is phenomenal, just a phenomenal chase. 437, here's the radar reflectivity. You see that where we're at, the circulation is now past us, and we're in heavy rain, and it's a squall line. It shows over. Wow, amazing. Here, it's still roping out just off the highway to our south. Again, we're in the notch, looking southeast. Now, in this kind of a situation, this is where you get the best contrast of a dark-looking tornado against the light background. Not that I'm promoting chasing and notches, and I'm thinking, uh, we'll hear a little bit more about that in the next talk. Um, but to the south, there was a double jaw drop, all right? That's right. Brewer and Drake are on this. How many of you were on the Shawnee Tornado? Make me feel bad. Come on, come on. Oh, okay. How many of you were on the Wichita Tornado? Oh, well, good. I have some friends. Okay, good. And, of course, that was a wild tornado. All right, so the forecast wasn't too bad, but I missed this cluster down in central Oklahoma because I saw the dry air at 850 and it really turned me off to central Oklahoma, but I've learned my lesson again. I'll go ahead and play the dry line bulge next time because you know what's going to happen, right? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> because there are no rules. Yep. That's right. Okay, so in summary, I caught three tornadoes from two different storms. That's nice. Large tornado southwest of Wichita was rain wrapped and dissipated just before town. Both times I found myself in the notch north of the tornadoes, but the longer lasting storms were in Oklahoma. All right, now just a little digress here. Ideally, on a classic supercell, I like to be there, east of the hook, where I can photograph from one location the entire life cycle of a tornado. Just put it on the tripod and rotate it. But that doesn't happen all the time. Roads don't work out. Chasing strategy doesn't work out, and you have to chase other things. The problem with HPs is you run into this white barrier. This white barrier says that as this hook is wrapping up, you can't see squat unless you're in the night. So, being as sharp as I am, I am lured into the notch, right, to consume the bait. That's me. But that happens to be a dangerous thing. And uh, I can tell you I've been in the notch many times, and you know, it's, it's tough because road networks, you never know what's going to happen there, you don't know what the storm's going to do, it is dangerous. All right, that's your moment of zen. And now we move on to the final chase case of the day. That is the El Reno, Oklahoma tornado. How many of you were out on El Reno Day? Wow, quite a few of you, all right. Well, guess what? Coming up next year, we're having two more movies. If you can't get enough of Sharknado, one is called Sharkalanche. Snow is frozen water, science is sound. And then Sharky Cane, because both come from the sea. 
years. So watch these. For being promoted, I guarantee you, somewhere, maybe on the internet. Um, all right. So, let's have Italian for you. Just uh, 10 a.m. surface. 10 a.m. surface. I go out to Oklahoma City, uh, plot this map. Wow, look at this. Phenomenal chase scenario setting itself up. 84 over 56 for the southwest wind in Childress. You know it's pushing again. It's very similar to the prior case we had. The dry line bulge coming on out, stationary front over Kansas. We're not having Kansas play today. And then, uh, Look like just west of Oklahoma City. 79 over 71. Uh, you know that. That's some juice coming on up there. You know, when you see 70 dew points and a dry line bulge, you know it's chased. I don't care how strong the cap is. Right? Because you know those capes are off the chart. And when you have high cape, there is no rules. All right. So we have southwest 50 knots. This is May 31st, folks. Hello. When you get 50 knots over Oklahoma City, at May, end of May, usually systems weaken at this stage. 50 knots is definitely formidable. But we have the moisture driven all the way to Oklahoma City. We have this closed low sitting up over the Dakotas. The trough extends southward. Let's take a look higher up. Pretty well stacked there. We've got a west wind coming in. Ah, so a little weakness coming in through Amarillo. 25 knots, 20 knots. In Albuquerque, that spells, oh, perhaps HP. Weak middle level. And then we have a nice band, broad band of middle level flow here. 50 knots in Emerald, 50 knots in Albuquerque. Not bad. Okay. And the jet is to the north. So we're actually on the right side, or actually the wrong side of the jet. So it's like, hmm, what's going to happen here now? Yeah, look at those winds over Dodge City. 85 knots. Okay. Oh, we love this. <laughs> We love this. Just as I was getting into the good stuff. All right. <laughs> yeah, they're not fire alarms. We've heard those before, haven't we? All right, well, at 10 a.m., the visible satellite, if you can see behind it, would actually show no clouds whatsoever. So, no clouds whatsoever were there. What does that mean? If you don't even get straddle cue. You don't even get straddle Q. That means you got moisture shunted off to the east. That means your cap is holding quite well. I don't think there's much going on. And you're really going to have to zoom past because we've got a lot of slides on. <clears throat> like, again, I'm, I'm like a shark here moving through water. I have a lot of slides. So on El Reno Day, we've got high dew points, a draw line coming on in, but the convection seems to be delayed. And you know, if you read some of the SPC outlooks that day, you noticed that they were kind of looking at maybe a late initiation, maybe something around 7 o'clock, because they saw that the strong cap was in place. All right, very good. Thank you. All right. Look at the moderate risk. And then we have 15%. Here's my forecast. Wow. 70 plus dew points in Oklahoma, 4,000 joules per cape. Uh, per kilogram, surface low near Sayer, backing east winds, boy, you gotta like that, helicity, clearing skies, ample heating, base of upper jet, strong winds over Oklahoma, nice directional speed shear, well, but there's a strong camp. Where will the southernmost storm be? This is the, almost the routine question we ask ourselves all the time. Target was Minko, which is actually near Union City, west. So I went out to Minko and I sat for a couple of hours on the wheat field. <sighs> you get really excited, don't you? You can still smell it in the air. You, you almost got this enormous amount of energy. You really can't control yourself, and you do some very awkward things. <laughs> and I'll talk about this. I just want to lead up to this. The cap was really strong. Uh, I was waiting for the cap to break. The holicity of the photograph up there, eh, not the best. Not much in the way of looping on the bottom. And then 3 p.m., nothing's happening, but I'm very excited. And then we have the cake. Shooting up into there, we have Oklahoma City area for STP, and we have the SCP, which is a supercell composite gradient on the west side near Western Oklahoma City. <laughs> Sometimes I cannot control myself. Fear of Mother Nature. So at 310, I was so excited to see the first puff. 
That's what I did. Okay. So now, 3.30, tea box. All right, tea box here. I'm out in a wheat field in the middle of nowhere. And uh, then we're seeing this. I'm not getting, I'm getting concerned about this. We're seeing one cell go up. It mushes out an orphan anvil, tiny skinny. Another one. But it begins to congeal there in the several cells at 5 o'clock. This is my view. I'm south of El Reno, and I'm looking west at 5.06, and I see this. Wow, looks like a tail end storm to there. But it was moving northeast. I want to go ahead and look at 5.42, jump a little bit. I actually went north of El Reno, like Howie was thinking, in fact, thinking these storms are going to go northeast and really race, but they weren't. It was anchored. And the yellow circle, why was I circling that area, west of El Reno on I-40? It's because on the radio velocity, at, this is 542, well before anybody saw a tornado. Back in the rain area, there was this nice couplet sitting there, in the rain. That's, see, this is 542 reflectivity, this is 542 radio velocity. You would really have to have your Bosch wiper blades on full on this one, wouldn't you? <laughs> Absolutely. All right, 547, still there. There's a couple of circulations going on there. Looks like a powerful RFD, but yet nobody was reporting any tornadoes because it's in the rain. What's going on? That's amazing to me. Anyways, I'm dropping south because I was in rain, and I see this notch developing on the reflectivity, and I know something's about to happen at 551. We still had the circulation center, but nobody's seeing anything. I'm going through the metropolis of El Reno catching every light. <laughs> I drop through from the rain, this is my first view of the El Reno storm at 554, looking southwest. We can see kind of a tapered base, the mid-level banding coming around it, anvil streaming off. I'm watching the radar, looking to the west, I'm seeing a hook develop in the reflectivity, but more importantly is the radio velocity. There's a couple of couplets still there. I'm south of on Highway 81, Again, the blue box is the square mile. And uh, looking to the west, the storm's coming near me. Not hearing any reports of tornado yet, 557. Supercell southwest, you know, I like to let a storm come to me every once in a while. But it was odd, it was moving east, moving to the right. And that usually spells a very violent storm when we have right moving storms. So now, hey, things are coming together at 6 o'clock. I'm about one and a half miles south of El Reno on Highway 81 with a horde of other chasers, and I think that's all the weather channel, and there we have the hook, but I can't see anything. But look at what's happening with this inflow developing. This is something that I see once in a rare moon, I'll tell you. <clears throat> We've got this folded inflow, red over to yellow. It's tagging the 70 knots, and now it's about 80 knots, and it's more than a square mile, northeast, <laughs> Do you think that circulation is going to intensify? <laughs> Absolutely. You see that, you know things are going to happen because that feeds right around and a tornado is forming at 6 o'clock. Sure enough, unbeknownst to me at the time, Gene Moore was saying multiple vortex tornado is south. He was literally in the notch looking south. And that's what, that's what lures you in, is this kind of contrast. You see dark colored cloud, South vortices swirling around. If you were south of that, you may get gray on gray if you're lucky before the preset happens. But this is your best photo vantage point. And that's what lures chasers in. 603, this is my view, looking to the west of the El Reno storm. You can see the tapered base, the level banding coming around. I was starting to hear reports of a tornado on the ground. I couldn't see it, but Brandon Jenkins saw it. He has this multiple vortex. And then I saw the hook begin to extend. And when, I, when a hook extends like this, sometimes it has a J at the end of it or basically a debris ball or something at the end of it. So you watch that carefully. <clears throat> Here, something is going on over my head. I have these clouds that are racing as fast as any hurricane that I've been in overhead. And look at the green sitting there southwest of El Reno. That's inflow folded over, folks. 80 knots, and we're getting a tremendous folding over on the way inbound. Now we're getting red pixels on top of green. 
tornado is in progress. We're hearing tornado on the ground to the west, and it's moving southeast. Wow, southeast. Now the hook is well developed here at 610. I decided that I was going to move west because I couldn't see it. So on Jensen Road, I went west to Choctaw, stopped about a half a mile south on Choctaw. There's the notch coming in. I had tremendous inflow. It was very difficult. You know, I try to get my camera out, put it up on the tripod. First I get my tripod out, then I go get my camera out, then I come back and my tripod's gone. <laughs> That's the kind of storm this was. Okay. Now we're getting 100 knots of massive inflow. Three to four miles. This is WSRAD-D. This isn't the mobile radars. This is back from Oklahoma City area. And you see over 100 knots inbound. Massive. But look at the inflow. The inflow is much larger, much more intense. That's got to go somewhere. That's got to go into this unprecedented type of circulation that we're seeing here. Now the hook folds back on itself. There's the notch, and I'm just about ready to get in the edge of the canyon. My winds are still bucking out of the east-southeast, and I'm still stationary. I'm watching this thing. I'm filming it. What's going on? See what happens next. And again, the blue square is a square mile, so I'm still about three miles away. Meanwhile, look at what's happening in the radio velocity. This thing continues to increase beyond anything I've ever seen, except in hurricanes. The broad inflow folding over massively, uh, and we have also the return inbounds folding over massively. And I'm sitting there northeast of the tornado. Now, this is about the time that I decided, hmm, maybe I think about leaving here. All right, maybe that tornado is a little too close. I don't want the tornado to get south of me. Why? Because if a tornado was south of you and you have an open hook, that hook can close on you and that tornado can go north. I call it the yo-yo effect. It's another slang term. It's when the hook comes out and then comes back in. It goes out and then back in. You don't want to be north of a tornado. Here's my view, though. I'm mesmerized by this. Um, 616. Rain ramp tornado to the southwest, off to the left there. What's this on the right? Is that another lowering, perhaps? Another tornado is going to develop on that thing? Could be. Looking more to the west. Look at this tail cut. This thing was streaming in like a jet. Coming south. These people in the house, they uh, came out and they said, we're out of here. And they were part of the mass exodus southward. But I can't get my eyes off this. 617, rain wrap tornado in my southwest. And again, I'm a mile and a half uh, west of 81. This thing begins to have these low cloud tags forming right around the, with the precip. And you don't want to get in the precip. Why? Because if you're in the precip, you're in the tornado. So you don't want to get in there. So I, I meant it to uh, stay out. All right, well, here's some chase strategy for you. When encountering a rain ramp tornado, I try to keep the tornado at most to my southwest. If it goes south of me, I'm in trouble. I don't want to get in the rain ramped area. I want to bail east, first option, or bail north into the core, second option. I allow typically five minutes for safety. I assume the tornado was moving at 30 miles an hour, so I felt safe being two and a half miles from that tornado. I was mistaken. A tornado closed much faster than 30 miles an hour. We'll see that. So here I am, and all of a sudden my winds go calm. When your winds go calm from hurricane force out of the east to calm, what does that mean? That means you're going through a transition zone between inflow and rain wrap outflow. It's time to get out of there. So at 619, I bailed north on Choctaw. I got to Jensen Road, and then I knew I was doomed. There, on the other side of the intersection, trying to see which one of us is going to beat through the stop sign, is Jeff Pytrowski. <laughs> if you see Jeff Pytrowski, you know you're too close. <laughs> so we came to let Jeff go, and we followed his tail, and I mean we really followed his tail. We are biting his, his tailgate. Okay, so 619 radio velocity. It's starting to weaken a little bit, 100 knots, but the inbounds were 140 knots. This is WSRED. 
This thing's folded over and trying to fold over again. Massive circulation. And again, that square blue box is a square mile. This is a massive store. All right, I want to show you some other Chasers photographs because this John Allen, who couldn't be here today, but he wanted to, uh, should have had this great wide angle shot showing the clear slot, the tornado in the vault side. I haven't heard of many reports of large hail with it, but I, it sure looked it. Maybe some of you got into it, but it was on the north side. I think you, an award goes to Jennifer Brindley for the super wide angle shot of El Reno with the wedge in the right and the barrel updraft overhead. Now, this is why being a farther away from the tornado could actually be better. Up close, you get a smudgy, mucky mess, but far away, you get a beautiful structure. So now, Interestingly, between the WSA R88D data and where the tornado was, there was definitely some skewness going on. Now, one of the reasons for that is the radar is not seeing what the tornado is on the ground. The radar is seeing upstairs, right? Thousands of feet upstairs. We had this eye that looked like I was going to get hit here, but the tornado was still more than a mile away from me, to the south. That's right, I said to the south. Now, what happened? I wanted to keep the tornado to my southwest. What I didn't anticipate was this thing at 623 began to accelerate and close right on my location. I uh, definitely a white knuckle drive east on Jensen Road. It was a paved road. That was fortunate. We raced to the east. And again, I didn't know Jensen Road was going to be paved. It worked out that way. Had that thing turned to mud, I would have been toast. And then uh, here the info begins to weaken. But the outflow is picking up steam here even further as it's crossed Highway 81, 623. And this is my view at 626. I've got a tornado on my butt. All right, to my southwest on Jensen Road. We've got rain wrapping off to the left, clear area off to the right. Now watch this, 627. This was amazing. I saw this sub vortex, which by all intents and purposes would have been good as a normal tornado, right? But it's a subvortex, huge. It forms on the left side, and then what happens? Boom. The tornado widens before my eyes. <clears throat> Do that again, because this is, this is what gets to be <clears throat> a white knuckle drive. Goes from that to that. I was getting concerned. <clears throat> I was getting concerned that the tornado was moving along with me and growing and then I was going to get hit. So, I managed to move as fast as I could. I actually passed Jeff Pietrowski. Now that's, that was amazing. <laughs> I passed Jeff Pietrowski. Yeah, you know, I felt a little better. But, uh, so I got east of that. There were uh, a bunch of pre-manufactured homes behind me and they started to disappear. And then I started getting pink insulation floating out of the sky like snow. So I knew it hit something. But the tornado, actually, look at this change here between the, the white circle where the tornado was and the reflectivity was actually skewed to the north. And this kind of illustrates the point. Don't bet your life on the radar because it may not be where you think it is. And that's one of the keys I think we need to draw from this. And I, yes, this is what I do. I, I look at the radar. I, I definitely depend on the radar. Now, here's where I'm at, racing to the east on Jensen Road. We've got this RFD, massive now, coming around. The inflow's weakened, but now we have this massive surging outflow. So I stopped. The manufactured homes were there in the horizon, getting chewed up at 632. This thing was starting to turn to the, to the left, or turn to the north, and here's uh, one of my views of west of the tornado. Gene Moore was just to my north. In fact, those might be my headlights in the very left edge of that. But uh, he had a little better view of that with himself. So now I'm up at Banner Road at I-40, and I feel, hey, I-40, there's nobody on it. Just like Howie said, the chaser's dream. I got an escape route. I felt that was okay. The tornado is now wrapped up. It's going to rope out and be okay. So we can just.